given that we're talking about, um, uh, you know, th this phenotype or whatnot, I know we have listeners that, um, would meet this phenotype. It occurred to mm -hmm. me if everybody in this country was put on a ketogenic diet, um, and they could adhere to it as just hypothetical, of course, what percent do you think would be lean mass hyper responders? Uh, you mentioned that the LMHR phenotype, which I've mentioned, I'm kind of on that phenotype. If I'm not taking a Zetamib, um, <laughs> as, uh, something that you kind of came about incidentally. Um, I know when I look at my labs, if there's anything off, uh, I, I kind of jump a little bit and get a little bit, uh, you know, I, I feel, I don't feel stressed from it, but I feel like I have to understand this and I have to change it. That's why my wife calls me the world's biggest hypochondriac. But um, uh, from finding that incidentally and um, like looking into it more, what have you noticed as um, someone who I guess has a personal and academic interest in that? Um, what, what have you noticed as far as like the conventional medicine or academia responding well to that or not responding well to that? Yeah, I mean... When it's just talked about secondhand, I'll tell you, even as someone who's relatively credentialed, it's such a bizarre thing in medicine that if someone doesn't have the, the PubMed IDs in front of them and is having their face shoved into them, they won't believe you. Like I've mentioned before, oh yeah, like we have this patient with an LDL of like 600. They're like, this must just be a confused medical student. There's no way. No way. Um, it's It's... I've tried to think of a good analogy to explain how bizarre this is to people, but I guess I put it like this. Imagine you're, you know, in a food court or any public area, and you see people kind of walking in and out, um, and then you just see someone walk in who's like nine feet tall. Like, that's what a lean mass hyperresponder is. It is the most bizarre thing. But now pause and think, Okay, what if after that nine foot tall person, you know, you, you look at them and your eyes like bug out, but then just 12 more nine foot tall people walk in. So it's not just a single outlier, but it's actually starting to develop a pattern. Like this is something that stands out and is weird. And the lipid phenotype of lean mass hyperresponders is weird for anybody that's looked at lipids. To have an LDL over 200, an HDL over 80, and a triglyceride of under 70, that union of markers is extremely rare at a population level, yep. given that the population is mostly a mixed diet. But it's actually not that rare when you start to dig into uh, ketogenic populations who are lean. Then it becomes very common. So it's like, imagine if you found an island where all the people were nine feet tall, like human beings nine feet tall. You just very clearly determine, conclude that this is a unique population. There's something different about them. And then the question becomes, well, what is different about them and what is driving this phenotype? And the very interesting, well, there are a lot of interesting things about lean mass hyperresponders, but the interesting thing that I guess I would use to differentiate it from other lipid phenotypes is, is if you go to your standard clinician and talk to them about cholesterol levels, they'll think that they move glacially slow and that they're probably set largely from birth. If your levels are super high, so if you walk in and you have an LDL that's above 200, let alone above 500, like mine has been, they'll just assume you have a genetic defect. You must have FH. There is no other possibility in the literature to their minds. But that's not the case here. That's not the case here because a lot of it, well, LMHR is almost, they have normal LDL at baseline almost by definition. So my baseline LDL on a mixed diet, and when I say mixed, I mean Western diet, mm -hmm. was 90s, right? And then it goes into the 500s. But that's not even the weirdest thing. The weirdest thing are the levers that push it there. Mm -hmm. So the standard thing we think about, okay, aside from genetics, is things like saturated fat. Yep. Saturated fat has very little impact on my LDL. In fact, my LDL peak of 545 milligrams per deciliter occurred when I was eating very low cholesterol and a 1 to 567 gram ratio of saturated to unsaturated fat. So for over one gram of saturated fat, 1.567 grams of unsaturated fat. That means my fat profile was 15% saturated, 85% unsaturated, which is like, you know, the saturated, unsaturated fat, roughly of olive oil. I was not guzzling butter and my cholesterol intake was very low. Um, I'll explain why it was low in a sec, 
other levers that push my LDL up is if I'm more active and um, if I'm leaner. So if I lose body fat. So how do you explain this phenotype whereby LDL shoots through the roof with carbohydrate restriction, but it's not really driven by saturated fat. In fact, it can occur even in like zero cholesterol vegan ketogenic context. And then it goes up further with exercise and the leaner you get. And it occurs as part of a triad with also very, very high HDL and low triglycerides. So this isn't just a matter of let's try to explain the high LDL. You have to explain all those things, mm -hmm. including like a dose response relationship whereby the lower the BMI goes, the higher the LDL goes. And now we've shown that in, um, we were talking about the hierarchy of evidence, we now have a meta-analysis of randomized controlled trials. So it doesn't get higher than that. So there's clearly a bona fide phenotype here, something going on. Yep. And it's only just emerged into the literature within the last couple of years. And so it's something we're exploring and it's something I'm incredibly excited about because you know, in these outliers, I think there is so much to learn about physiology. When you start to try to build models to explain the phenotype and then test those models rigorously, you end up with these bizarre, bizarre phenomenons, bizarre phenomenons that are consistent with the physiology that you can predict. Hence the, and I'm sure we get into it, like Oreo versus statin study, where I lowered my cholesterol with Oreo cookies. It sounds like a joke. And currently the title, I'm always changing the title, but the video abstract is, this is not a joke. Because it sounds like I'm trolling. And at some level, it's like legit bait. It's trolling a little bit in a sense, but it's legitimate. It's like, we have now a phenotype that we're studying and a model around it where I can predict and be right that I can actually use cookies to lower cholesterol. Now... Do you want to just shrug that off as like, this is a weird outlier? Or do you want to kind of understand why this occurs? And I think anybody curious wants to understand, well, why is this happening? Yeah, uh, I think that's a great summary. And I do think that the proposed mechanisms make a lot of sense. Um, listeners of the podcast, obviously, we've talked about how for the average American, saturated fat, even often more so than cholesterol via the LDL receptor drives um, LDL and ApoB up. And also yeah. for those listening... We've talked about LP little a and also APOE genotypes before. Yes, those things um, will be characterized like through the future literature or whatnot. Uh, I'm sure uh, as uh, somebody who's kind of like independent and also curious of um, how those things would affect both neurologic um, and uh, cardiovascular outcomes. So, yeah, uh, I, I, I'll, I'll just emphasize, I think, I think the point that gets confused is when I say like BMI dominates over saturated fat, it gets conflated with the statement saturated fat doesn't affect lean mass hyperresponders. That's not the case. Yep. But we're talking orders of magnitude here. So eating butter is not going to get your LDL to 500. It's just not going to do it. It might bump it a little bit, but we are talking about like serious different orders of magnitude here. Um, yep. So yeah, no, for the average person and for lean mass hyperresponders, saturated fat versus unsaturated will raise your LDL, as you said, via downregulation of the LDL receptor. But that doesn't explain the phenotype we're seeing here. It doesn't mean saturated fat doesn't affect lean mass hyperresponders. It just means it's not a dominant factor. Yeah, uh, instructions unclear. Uh, I'm going to just consume as much saturated fat as I possibly can. <laughs> uh, just, just kidding there. Um, yeah. I guess uh, given that we're talking about uh, you know, th this phenotype or whatnot. I know we have listeners that um, would meet this phenotype. It occurred to mm -hmm. me, if everybody in this country was put on a ketogenic diet um, and they could adhere to it, as it is hypothetical, of course, what percent do you think would be lean mass hyperresponders? Well, I think a low percent because most people aren't that lean. I think the average body fat percent, you probably have these numbers better than I do, but I think for an American male is around 30% body fat, woman 40%. Most people aren't lean. 70-ish percent are overweight. So I don't think most would yep. um, develop the LMHR phenotype. And just for a little bit more context, when we did the meta-analysis of randomized control trials, what we found is an inverse relationship between BMI and LDL change, but whereby people in the middle actually, so overweight and class one obesity, when they go low carb, no change in LDL. Um, when people with a normal BMI, so a normal, not actually population norm, but under 25, they see the LDL increases. And people with class 2 obesity actually see LDL decreases. 
So, mm -hmm. you know, depending on your start point, I, you know, would expect different things. But if you ask the different question, how many very lean athletic people would convert to the lean mass hyperresponder phenotype? That's in the realm of speculation. I'm going to guess over 50%. This is oh. something we've wanted to do, me, Dave, and Adrian, for a while, which is called what we call the gym hypothesis, because we think that if we went to a gym, we could just on site look at like, I want to pick that person and that person and that person and that person, and I want to control their diets for six weeks, and we want to see how many we can convert. And I think I could just look at certain people and determine whether or not I could turn them into a lean mass hyperresponder by controlling their diet. And I think I could probably be successful with over 50% of cases, probably over 75%. But again, this brings up a nuanced topic. Like a lot of these things, they sound like black or white. Like I'm saying, this is completely metabolic in a response versus this is, you know, a genetic phenotype. You could have permissive genetics. You yeah. could have like a, you know, a set of genetic foundation that is required for the metabolic phenotype to manifest, which is why I don't say 100%. Because I, I can't possibly know. I don't know, you know, all 20,000 human genes and their annotation and function. So it would be arrogant to me to say 100%. But just based on what I've seen, I would, I would guess over 50, over 75% of lean people if you could put them on a truly ketogenic diet for a little while. But that remains to be determined. So this is all still within the realm of me guessing. Interesting. Um, if there's anybody out there who has tried a ketogenic diet that has not been a lean mass hyper responder. Maybe we should just call it a lean mass normal physiologic responder if it's more than 50% of people. Um, let us know in the comments. And I guess um, a, by definition, uh, the lean would be um, less than about 15% for males on a DEXA. So between about 5 to 12% on bioimpedance tests. Uh, pretty common to see in bodies and whatnot come back five to 10% lower than DEXAs for males and probably less than about 23, maybe 25%, probably less than 23% for females. Um, yeah. It's not a bit leaner on DEXA, but um, yeah, uh, definitely would have to be lean. I agree. I've seen very few people who are actually very lean and actually very low carb. Sometimes people say they're low carb and then you find out that they're just eating sweet potatoes. Um, but I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm sure an example exists and I'd want to know what is special about that person. Also, you brought yeah. up the idea, you, you, you mentioned some lean thresholds and this question always comes up. So I'm just going to attack it prophylactically, which is if you look at our literature, we use BMI cutoffs yep. and it's not because BMI is that good. People always bring up, Oh, what about people who are very muscular and lean? You're right. It's just a matter of the data that are available right now to analyze. So if we do a meta-analysis of 41 RCTs, they have not done DEXAs you know, at every time point in each of these studies. So we're limited by the data that are available for population studies. Mm -hmm. BMI is actually pretty good, but there are certainly exceptions. Very muscular people with BMIs of 29, but very low body fat that might manifest as lean mass hyperresponders. And vice versa, people with a BMI of 23 who are a little bit topy. So, yep. you know, there are people that break the rule for sure. Yeah, I uh, definitely agree. Uh, uh, everyone in this podcast realm is probably a body composition tracking enthusiast. But the, uh, yeah, that's always good to keep in mind with the BMI. Mm -hmm.